So Okay, welcome people just joining this morning. Give it a few moments to allow people to arrive. It is uh, maybe one of the earliest events that I've done around basic income. give it another 30 seconds or so and then we'll get started no great mike yeah is it helpful if we kind of keep obviously keep muted and then and then just put our cameras on when when it's yeah i think yeah yeah, yeah that'd sense. be brilliant yeah okay all righty so let's get uh let's get started uh, there'll be a few filtering in, um, but a warm welcome to this morning's uh, webinar, uh, which is titled Public Perceptions of Basic Income in the West Midlands Red Wall. Uh, and my name is Michael Pugh. I'm the co-founder and director of the Basic Income Conversation. And my role this morning is, is acting as a bit of a chair as, and, and a host. Um, thank you for those who have made the effort to attend bright and early this morning at 9 a.m. Uh, this Thursday. Um, but also to those of you watching back on, on YouTube or on the Centre for Brexit Studies website, um, really warm welcome to, to have you here uh, listening in. Uh, this is one of the Centre for Brexit Studies monthly webinars uh, where they discuss the latest work and research that they are doing. The Centre for Brexit Studies is a research centre which explores all aspects of Brexit, uh, and the referendum and life beyond the, the European Union. But it's not just Brexit it looks at. The team of experts there examine the impact Brexit could have on society, on business and the economy. And excitingly for us today, uh, that's, led, that's led the team to be looking at the issue of universal basic income, which is gonna be our focus. So this is a very special webinar in that they've, I'm not from the Center for Brexit Studies, they partnered with us at the Basic Income Conversation to host this morning's conversation about public perceptions of, of this big idea. So how did this partnership that we've, we have come about? Well, us at the Basic Income Conversation are on the side of people who want to see a basic income happen. We blend organising, uh, advocacy and research to promote basic income in the UK. And we think it's the best way, we think conversation is the best way to get people talking about the idea hence why we're called The Conversation. Um, and we host conversations like the one that we're having this morning, but we've also created a toolkit for people to start their own conversations. Um, but we've been really conscious that how people have the conversations is just as important as them having them in the first place. And it's, it's particularly how we talk about basic income. Are there certain phrases or stories or ways of talking about the idea that make people more or less interested. Basically, have we got that narrative and frame right? Um, is that acronym UBI, does that people even understand that as a concept? And so that's, that's our interest in really understanding what public perceptions are of this idea, because if we can better understand public perceptions and how people view it, we will be better able to craft effective campaign messages. So mean, what's, that's our interest. Meanwhile, the Centre for Brexit Studies have over the last year carried out uh, quite a bit of research into basic income, particularly on the economic side. Uh, they last year published research on how to pay for a basic income, outlining various tax and benefit suggestions um, to make basic income a reality. And you can check those out on the Centre for Brexit uh, Studies website. Um, so, so this work to look at public perceptions is a bit of a follow up from, from that work. Um, and because, of course, if we are to see those, those economic changes um, towards a basic income become a reality, they're going to need to be won at the ballot box. Um, so we wanted to test campaign messages in the most important areas with electoral significance. So you'll hear us make quite a bit of reference this morning to the so-called red wall. Um, uh, in some ways, it's quite a frustrating term, but it's been used to describe constituencies that were long held Labour seats until the Conservatives 
won them in, in 2017 and particularly in 2019. So they're generally characterised as post-industrial areas um, that were more likely to vote Brexit, which of course the, 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 set, the centre has done a lot of work on, um, and they've tended to be in areas in the northwest and northeast and parts of the, the West Midlands as well, uh, which is of interest to us today. So whatever one thinks of the term, these areas are now kind of the centre ground of British, British politics where elections are going to be won and lost. So it's vital that we understand how basic income goes down uh, with voters in those areas. So it's a very timely question, given that we are on the eve of elections taking place just next Thursday. Uh, the West Midlands will be voting uh, for a second time for its uh, Metro Mayor, uh, which is currently Mayor Andy Street. Uh, he's running for re-election. Um, and there are other elections happening across Scotland, Wales uh, and England where basic income is increasingly becoming a topic of conversation for voters. So right across the country, we've seen politicians back calls for a basic income. That's been from people like Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister in Scotland from the SNP, Andy Burnham, the, the Labour mayor for, for Greater Manchester, Adam Price, one of the leaders of Plaid Cymru in, in Wales, um, Sean Berry, the leader of the Greens, who's running for mayor in, in London and Jane Dodds, the leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, all of quite prominent figures have come out and backed basic income. And, and we're hoping that voters will agree, but it will be a test to see what happens next Thursday. So the question of do voters agree, particularly in the so-called red wall in, in the West Midlands, that's our question today. And we'll be hearing some initial results of some focus groups that we've done in collaboration. Well, the Centre for Brexit Studies have led, but we've, we've kind of helped collaborate on. Um, so this morning we're going to hear from Professor Alex de Reuter, um, who's going to present the initial findings of the research for about 20 to 25 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll have a very special guest in uh, Reverend Karen Weber. Uh, Karen is a Methodist minister in Birmingham uh, and is also one of the co-directors of Basic Income UK. She's a very experienced basic income advocate in the region uh, and she'll be sharing her reactions to that research. And, and then we'll have a Q&A uh, and, a, and a discussion. Um, it's going to be fairly informal, but we, we, we hope you put your questions into the panel and myself um, either through the chat box or the uh, Q&A function on, on Zoom. Um, so we can't promise that we'll get to all of them, but I reckon we can and, and we'll, we'll give it a good go. Um, and you'll, you'll, so we're, we're on a webinar. It's going to be a bit like watching TV, um, but you do play a really important role if you're, if you're tuning in. So we'd love to hear where, who you are and where you're calling in from. So if you could put in the chat box, um, just put your name and, and where you're calling in from this morning, that would be wonderful just to see who we've got joining us um, and, uh, and, and, and will help us with the conversation later when you're, when you're popping your questions in. Uh, a reminder that this is being recorded um, and so you can watch this back later on the Centre for Brexit Studies website or on their YouTube channel. Um, I think that's probably enough of my voice uh, uh, and, and an introduction. So let's get into this then. So I'd first like to introduce Professor Alex de Reuter. Uh, he's a professor at the Birmingham City University and serves as the director of its Centre for Brexit Studies. He brings such a wealth of research experience and academic engagement, areas around globalisation, regional economic development, labour market and social uh, exclusion issues. He's published over 60 academic outputs in, in some of the leading and international economic journals. And has been a recipient of, of research funding, including being an investigator in the ESRC funded study on the effects of subsequent employment experience for workers from MG Rover plants, uh, obviously locally in, in 2005. He's undertaken numerous media interviews, particularly, I imagine, like lots in the last few years around Brexit um, and thinking about how, how that impacts the UK and manufacturing sectors um, and, and really interested in exploring the work around the gig economy. Uh, and I suppose that's, Alex, that's your kind of real interest in, in basic income. And I'm sure you're going to share a little bit about that in your presentation. Uh, and just finally, he's a board member of the Regional Studies Association. So quite a long introduction there for you, Alex. So much experience that you're going to uh, give to us this morning. Um, so over to you um, and for the next sort of 20 to 25 minutes or so. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. And um, just uh, apologies for everyone on the nature of the image there. I mean, it's... Uh, a dodgy webcam i'm afraid it's not not a, a still life as such <clears throat> but i do have a presentation for you so most of that will be you know no problems with seeing that on the screen yeah michael i mean absolutely spot on i mean i've, I've been researching um what one may call labor market precariousness you know um, 
casual work, agency work, temping, uh, gig economy, as it's now known, for, for a good 25 years. And, and that led me to the interest in basic income. Because I, I think, for, you know, when you have a growing proportion of the workforce existing in, in highly insecure employment arrangements, I mean, as the pandemic has shown, you know, you, you can very, all of a sudden, arbitrarily lose your income. And, and, and that, to me, I think, you know, really sort of underscore the significance of, of what we term UBI in the literature. But it's not just about precariousness, of course. There are other angles to explore the utility of um, a basic income, you know, not least the notion of a, a, a basic just society where everyone is, you know, given an opportunity in life to start out from a secure base. So hopefully I can touch on some of these issues today. So I will try and share my presentation now. Um, Yeah, it should be that one. Okay, I believe that's now sharing. You can see that, Michael? Yes, uh, cool. if you want to just put it in present view. Yeah, now I'll, I'll pop it in present mode. Grand, now that we've got that. Is it that one? No, that one, there we go, slideshow, All right. Great, yes, so this, this work that we're doing, as, as Michael has um, attested, uh, arose out of some focus group research um, very early on this year, basically. And uh, we, we were interested in trying to explore what, what uh, people think of the, the concept of a basic income. And I suppose that the, the, the angle that we were coming at here was the, the notion in the debate around Brexit of so-called left behind places or uh, places that may feel particularly disadvantaged. And, and uh, as you mentioned, Michael, you know, the, the notion of a red wall, the, these seats that traditionally voted Labour, but you know, switched to the Conservatives in, in the last couple of elections, was something we wanted to try and explore because, I mean, uh, you know, fr from a political angle, of course, uh, these seats are very significant and, and will continue to be so in, in, in the coming years. And, and I think one of the arguments here that's been ascribed to people who, who, who uh, switch from Labour to the Conservatives is that, um, that they're of the, 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 the idea that you don't get something for nothing, for example, is a test to appeal to people who may see themselves as having been hard workers and, and are then... Um, positive to, to hold certain views on maybe people who receive unemployment benefits and the like, or housing benefit. And so we wanted to tease out these perceptions. We wanted to see what, what people really thought in that regard, you know, to how true was this sort of notion and then sort of test the concept of a basic income. Yeah, and I, and I will declare up front, I'm a, I am a supporter of the concept, as I said, you know, having researched insecure work for, you know, two or three decades now. I do think it is a big part of the answer to, to the phenomenon that we see around us in terms of economic and social insecurity. So that's what led to our interest here. So I'm going to report on those findings, but also tease out some background information on the, the economic context. So to try and get us to a stage where, where, where you know, I try to make a pitch why I think a, a basic income has particular appeal now. Obviously, the COVID-19 context has really shone a harsh light on this with the, the number of people on furlough now who otherwise would have lost their jobs, you know, holding that to stark account. And if you want to take a very simple statistic of what's happened in the last 12 months, the claimant count of those on um, universal credit essentially in the West Midlands has doubled. You know, it jumped up in March and it's held steady since then and, and is only being prevented from going up because of uh, people currently on furlough. So that's your COVID-19 context. And there are two particular angles here we'll, we'll explore. But uh, in terms of the concept of a universal basic income, I mean, it's the idea here is that basically it's a cash payment. You get it on a regular basis, perhaps monthly. It's for everybody. And it doesn't matter how much you earn or what your employment situation is. It's unconditional in that regard. Everybody gets it. Adult, child, you know, single, married, double income earners, no income earners. That's the whole notion of it, so that everybody gets a certain amount of money. Now, in terms of the, the, the perceived generosity of a UBI, there are different models out there in terms of how much you know one could pay people for it. Um, the paper that Michael talks about on our website, uh, we try and make the case to say that everybody, well, every adult should be receiving an amount of money equivalent to the state pension. That's about 
nine grand a year. And we suggest about half of that for every child. And there are different ways in how you can argue that it would be paid for, you know, essentially through reforming the taxation system, which I might come back to. But, and I think this is a point I want to emphasize certainly in terms of my own view on the UBI, um, we are not positing a, a basic income as a substitute for the welfare state. I, I see UBI as a key component of that, but I don't see it as being an excuse for arguments such as, I don't know, to dilute the access to free public health provision in the form of the NHS. I see it as complementing those existing arrangements. And indeed on that note around the, you know, the affordability of a basic income, um, you know, if you think of the NHS and getting free healthcare at the point of delivery, um, we can fund that. So, you know, why can't we fund the notion of a, a basic cash payment the same way? But what I wanted to do here in terms of setting up the research was to explore two themes as to why I think a UBI has a, a special uh, a special utility now. And that is to, to, A, look at the nature of public and social service provision in the last 10 years, and then B, look at the nature of the labour market in that same period. And if you look at this chart here in terms of uh, real per capita government spending since 2007, um, I mean, the key date there, of course, in uh, following the financial crisis in 2007 is the change of government in 2010. What you can see there in terms of per capita spending is that apart from the old age pension and the NHS, everything else in terms of public services, community social services, education services, schools has declined in real terms. Yeah, and, and, and I think one of the key stark contrast here is the, the spending on education there, yeah, you know, which really has declined. So a very crude interpretation of this chart would be to say that we've seen in effect net cash transfers from children to old people. You know, that's, that's in very brute, simple terms what this chart tells you. But we're not arguing that the state pension should somehow be diluted. I mean, my own stance is that, you know, we should all be leveled up in the same fashion. But that's a very stark illustration here, because what, what this tells you is that the, the social wage, if you like, all those, those non-pay benefits that a welfare state gives you in real terms have been eroded. And even though the NHS here has had its funding in effect ring fenced, given an aging population and increased demands for health services, and of course the the commensurate decline in social and community services, which in turn puts upward pressure back on the health system, one could very well argue that in real terms, um, spending on the NHS has been squeezed, although you know not in absolute nominal terms, but also this 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 graph sort of conceals that. You know, the effect of increased demand is to put further squeeze on health provision as well. So that's not without consequence. And what are some of these consequences? This chart, you know, shocked me. Because if you compare this chart to other countries in Europe, the UK really is an outlier. And that after this period in 2010, the notion of um, a progressive developed state as having a gradual increase in life expectancy really takes a turn for the worse. So, you know, is it any surprise that if you hollow out lots of services and you cut spending in areas that assist people's health and well-being, you know, maybe the impact on old age care, for example, that this has dropped away. So that, that's quite staggering, really, that we've seen this. Now, you know, again, in very crude terms, one can pin this on austerity. You know, if you think back to that previous chart with the cuts in spending, that's austerity. Here's the impact of austerity. Coming to the current COVID-19 context, of course, um, apart from combating the immediate pandemic, if you actually look at government spending again for those said similar departments, uh, the Treasury and the Chancellor Sunak are really taking an ax to them. So we're gonna see the impact of austerity too over the coming couple of years and maybe more. So here's the impact of austerity one. On the other side of the coin, what's happening to the birth rate? Well, last year in England and Wales, it stood at 1.6. And according to the population center research here, it's predicted to drop to 1.4 by 2023. Now very simply put, holding the population steady in effect needs a rate of 2.1 births per woman in this country. 
Now, one of the, the more, I think, silly tongue-in-cheek comments around COVID-19 was this notion that we might have seen an increase in the birth rate. But, you know, if this is anything to go by, economic insecurity accelerated by COVID does not induce one to want to procreate. Now, I mean, why is that significant? Well, if you have an aging population, if you have this steep decline in a birth rate, if you have the squeeze put on immigration, you are going to see increased pressure on public service delivery in the future. And you are going to see a, an aging population potentially in effect increase in being expected to look after its own health and well-being in retirement. So this to me is the sort of health and society context underpinning the, the, the renewed urgency in my mind to, to a UBI. If we then take away those, those you know, margins that in terms of life expectancy and, and what's happening with um, birth rates and we consider the nature of the labor market in this country, which is, is, is my main focus, um, despite all this talk around the gig economy and the fact that um, platform workers account for a relatively small proportion of the, the, the UK workforce, maybe you know, a couple of million, if you take a wider definition of, of insecurity, you have, and I think here's a, here's a key figure here. If you look here, you have about 8 million employees who've been with their current employer for less than two years continuous service. Well, why is that significant? That is significant because in 2013, the Conservative Liberal Democrat Coalition government raised the qualifying threshold for unfair dismissal provision law coverage from one year to two years. So all of these people here in this category potentially can be dismissed for some, for no, no reason at all, you know, or, or some, some arbitrary notion of just being, you know, see you later, can't afford you anymore. And COVID-19, of course, really, really exacerbates that context. So, you know, other categories here, here's a job that's not permanent in some way. These people are the most stereotypical gig workers. They are called dependent contractors. These are people who are nominally self-employed, but they only have one client. In other words, like an employee, but without all the protection to being an employee. This stricture here, notwithstanding. Then you have an, another category here. Some of these overlap incidentally, as you might imagine. You know, one and a half million people who were out of employment in the previous 12 months. And there's your zero hours contracts. So very crudely put here, uh, roughly a third of the workforce in the UK experienced some significant form of what we call precarity or precariousness in that their job is, is highly exposed to, to, to uh, some semblance of uh, short notice and arbitrary dismissal. Now, this to me is the labour market context of the appeal of a, a universal basic income, because over the past 30 years, we've had you know, a, a, a trend which has been referred to as labour market deregulation and labour flexibility. In essence, what that means in practice is to make work more insecure and easier to fire people. Now, you may argue the virtues of having a, a flexible hire and fire labour market, but what it does do is it really exposes people if they lose their job, as we're seeing now. The other angle here, which I don't really cover on this, but which is significant in the context of the UK, is... Um, the fact that if you get ill and you don't have a, a generous company or organizational sick pay scheme, you know, public sector workers are more secure in this regard, obviously, um, and you have to fall back on statutory sick pay, you're only qualifying for about £95 a week. Now, it's pretty obvious that people can't live on £95 a week if they have bills to pay and a mortgage and so on. So surprise, surprise, in terms of a pandemic, what you want to do if somebody falls ill is to discourage them from going to work. And of course, this was one of the arguments around the self-employed. If they don't work, they don't eat, basically. So many were missed by the initial government response. And so therefore, you know, a basic income is good for this. It, it eliminates that problem. If you have a, a basic cash allowance that gives you enough to live on, live on, then the pressure to go to work if you're ill diminishes. It's almost like a universal sick pay scheme in that regard. And so, you know, traditional income protection schemes respond very poorly to precarious employment. And as we've seen with COVID-19, the vast scale of government borrowing, you know, in con contrast to Theresa May's famous statement about there being no magic money tree, um, 
actually challenges perceptions around affordability. You know, um, what have we spent on, on combating COVID-19 so far? Maybe 320 billion? You know, that would be more than enough to pay for a, 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 a you know, a rudimentary basic income, for example. And so we would argue then that this really challenges public perceptions around affordability and increases the policy space, political space for policy innovation. And, and therefore, as Michael was commenting earlier, you know, you know, we're seeing increased interest in political parties accordingly. Not just the preserve of the left wing, of course, uh, a very famous or perhaps the most famous right wing economist, Milton Friedman, um, made the case for what he referred to as a negative income tax back in the 1960s. Now that it's administered slightly different to a UBI, but has the same effect. You know, it's something everyone would benefit from. So the language of a basic income isn't just for lefties. You know, it can be utilised by everybody. And so, with this in mind, earlier this year we held focus groups in Northfield, Dudley, West Bromwich, Walsall, and North Worcestershire. Now I use that term loosely because these were all held online. So we were trying to draw participants from those boroughs and localities. They took about one hour, well, nearly all, almost exactly an hour for pretty much all of them. And um, the average size in the focus group was about four to six people. And uh, you know, the, the, the precondition to doing them was to preserve anonymity and confidentiality. And they, they just followed a semi-structured interview format, exploring a number of themes, which I'm going to go through. So attitudes towards a basic income, the impact of COVID-19, what would you do with a basic income? What changes would it have on your locality? What impact would it have on your work or how you approach working? And would you vote for a political candidate supporting UBI? So for the rest of this, I'm just going to go through some of these perceptions and then um, we'll sort of wrap up and try and keep the time. So trying to attest the notion here that it's, is it something for nothing? Well, participant number two in Walsall commented in principle, it's a brilliant idea, but there needs to be something there for people to work towards. You know, this notion that perhaps getting a basic income provides a disincentive to seeking paid employment is one of the arguments typically held against it. But participant five, for example, in Dudley, I know as far as the gig economy is concerned, that it was one of the reasons I thought, well, well, maybe it would be good because my brother and other people I know work in the gig economy and it's exploitative. So again, the arbitrary notion of um, very quickly losing your income there. Participant number one in Dudley suggested, well, you know, people don't want to go and ask for handouts. And uh, this person, I think, had a social work background. But we work with the most vulnerable children in society. We have to go out and try and provide as much as we can. But a lot of families, they just try and keep it secret and not let people know that they're struggling because nobody wants to admit that they can't feed the children. And that, that's quite a thing, really, isn't it? To say that, you know, that we, we live in a country where the median wage for a full-time worker is about 27,000 pounds. Yeah, compare that to the average price of a house in Birmingham. Think about it. Um, before we consider all the other expenses, you know, and the expenses related to having a family. So um, this really makes a cultural statement in my mind that the degree to which people in, in receiving some form of benefit have been stigmatised over the last 20 years, particularly the last 10 years, you only have to think of programmes like Benefit Street to sort of get an inkling of that. And, and, I, and I think one of the challenges towards implementing and, and encouraging UBI is this notion that if you lost your job in COVID-19, it was your fault. You know, there, there is a social attitude survey out there that suggests that half of people in the UK think if you lost your job because of COVID-19, you were underperforming. It's a very interesting line of thought if you work for pret a -Manger and Pret had to shut down its branch because nobody was coming into the city centre to buy a sandwich. But anyway... So this is quite a challenge, I think, you know, that it's this notion that some, some notion of hidden poverty because people don't want to ask for handouts. In my mind, perhaps one of the contradictions between before COVID-19 erupted um, was an unemployment rate of around 5%, which at face value sounds good until you consider most of the jobs growth in the last 10 years has been in precarious forms of work. And yet we have record use of food banks in this country. So. 
participant five. Yeah, I have a friend that was like that. Actually, she used to because she'd get off her jobs. She'd been on benefits for years and she'd get off her jobs, but she'd say it's not me worth taking it because it's only a temporary job. And yeah, I won't get any benefits for the four weeks and I've got bills. Now, here's our point about traditional benefit systems not really being able to accommodate precarious forms of work because if you have to sign on for a temporary job and the, the universal credit cycle begins again, you again have that weight. That's a real disincentive to work in itself in my mind. Now, the, here was a key point. Here was a key point of, of people who perhaps thought they were in a, a professional job, a job which required a degree, um, this person from memory was working in uh, that field that's termed public relations in, in the professional services sector in Birmingham. A lot of people in this country are living hand to hand at the moment and have been doing so for a long time where you can be in a very stable position, so you think on a very good wage, but if you lose your job, it can be a month or two months before you've got debt collectors at the door. Uh, to me, you know, researching labour market precariousness, that statement sums it up in a nutshell. You go back to our 8 million workers who, who don't have unfair dismissal coverage to fall back on, um, accelerated by the impact of the pandemic, and it's, you know, see you later. And I suppose if you came out of university and you expected to walk into a good job, this is a real shock. And I think this is where it really challenges the dominant cultural narrative on those receiving benefits, because I think one of the things that COVID has done, and I don't see any bright lights with COVID-19, but, you know, if, if you're in the middle of, of a, a very bad situation, you know, it doesn't force you to rethink things. If we have a situation now whereby those who are on benefits on universal credit, you know, let's say the claiming count was one and a half million pre-pandemic and now two and a half million perhaps, maybe it changes attitudes to people who are on welfare because all of a sudden people who thought they were grafting and hardworking and would never have to be dull bludgers and now find themselves exposed to the nature of the welfare system with all this parsimoniousness and all this benefit sanctions if you somehow fail to keep up regular job search. So I think, you know, this is one of the things I think that COVID-19 has shone a light on. Maybe there's a significant chunk of the population out there rethinking this. The earlier comment around half the population think if you lost your job, it's your fault notwithstanding. Participant three. Personally, I've seen some really like highly educated, clever people who probably always thought, you know, that I'm going to be okay. I've always got something to fall back on. And suddenly that's not the case. And this person subsequently commented, I would like to see not as many food banks because finally people will be able to buy their own food and stuff because it's just an awful situation at the moment. Now, I suppose, you know, you, you either care about these things or you don't. You know, the, the country seems split down the middle in that regard. Further considering, participant one from Malls, I got told yesterday I was being made redundant. And that's the first time since I started working in 1984. And it makes me feel effing terrified. Now, all of a sudden, this, I feel a bit abandoned, if I'm honest. What then would you do with the UBI? Um, I suppose one of the things we were trying to tease out here is whether people would sort of bank it away for a rainy day or whether they would spend it. This person commented that I'd feel so relieved um, that I didn't from time to time have to rely on my husband. He's a much better on a much better state pension than I am because I was for so many, some years I was a stay-at-home mum. I assume from that missed out on a, a certain period of uh, qualification in national insurance terms. What changes would have in your locality? And what we we're trying to do here to come back to the notion of left behind communities was to see whether, you know, if you increase people's basic uh, disposable income, whether that would have a, a, a positive effect on the locality. Um, this person, again, who was a bit skeptical of the concept, said, When I was a malls or council, I do know that we got to pump money into the non affluent areas that made little difference because it was still being vandalized by people who lived in that area for money, being for the good of their community. Um, we're sort of trying to probe the arguments here, you know, without to, to, to try and get some notion of whether having a, a guaranteed minimum income in this effect would, would have a, a, a positive effect in reducing perhaps drug use or vandalism or crime. Uh, at face value, you would say yes, although those will always be skeptical of that. 
what changes would it have on your work? Well, this person commented that you could use it to pay for courses, like if you wanted to go into legal or now other chartered surveyors or that kind of thing. And then yes, you could be able to afford to pay or put down funds to pay for courses and better yourself for the future. Now, and now again, I think, you know, coming at UBI from a different angle here, the notion that it can help affirm life choices for people, the idea that it would then enable you to perhaps retrain and do something that you wanted to do. Yeah, you know, this is a direct impact on, on, on personal fulfillment and quality of life and self-esteem. You know, so that this person saw that as a positive. And so then, um, how are we doing for time, Michael? Oh, we're good. Just maybe another, it looks like you're almost finished anyway. But a couple yeah, minutes. yep, grand. So we would argue that, that the whole affordability debate to be un blunt is a canard, you know, it's, it's a non sequitur. Um, you can pay for a universal basic income. You, know, you, you can set it at various levels or thresholds. You could set it at nine grand a year um, and, and four and a half for children, and it may come in at 400 billion, but you can actually whittle that down when you reform the tax system. You know, we, we outline this further in our paper, which is on our website. Um, in, in terms of understanding the feasibility, of course, um, well, in effect, by having a state pension or pension credit, we already do it. We already do pay a basic income to some portion of society. We just, you know, to reiterate my previous point, vis-a-vis -vis old people and children, inconsistently and inefficiently. So yeah, you know, there are child benefits in certain forms, personal allowances, you know, uh, your first 13 grand or thereabouts on, on, on your PAYE is tax-free. You know, that's like a basic income in effect. They, they're just sort of piecemeal and fragmented. If you look at the current model of universal credit and you look at the way it taxes people once they start earning a certain amount of money, we are engaging in a deliberate policy choice in this country to tax low earners effectively at higher marginal rates than high earners. You know, and, and I would say economic, that's just, just simply unjust. You know? In terms of the politics of a basic income, the, 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 the notion that it's something for nothing, well, um, you know, it's 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 hard to argue against that you know if somebody holds that view but you know to, to reiterate the obvious the nhs or, or equivalent is also in effect something for nothing you're not paying at the point of delivery when you go to see the doctor the same concept applies with you know pension credits and of course um if you're lucky enough to to have parents that own property you stand to inherit that you know Nobody argues against the notion that you should be able to inherit that, you know, even though one could well say that um, inheriting property is an arbitrary form of redistribution in itself. You know, you did nothing to acquire that, but you get that. What is the difference between that and a basic income? So if one tries to address the affordability criterion, you could taper a basic income as income rises. So in, in effect, you're implementing a more progressive tax system. But, you know, like I said, you, you could refer to our website to see that further. And so on that note, then I'm going to stop. Um, Michael, I'll hand it back to you. Um, I, I won't ask for any questions at this stage, I think. So um, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, to end. There we go. Um, yeah, so this is spotlight. there we go. Um, thank you, Alex, so much. That was really interesting. I mean, I, I, I was lucky enough to sit in on a lot of those um, focus groups but it's, it's interesting to hear that kind of put together in that way uh, we are going to, someone's people have begun putting some questions in which is great um could please carry on doing that if you can put some questions either in the q a box uh, or the or the chat box because we're going to come to those very shortly I, I know it sparked a couple of questions in my mind uh, or just comments even if it's just you know does this reflect uh, what, what your experience has been in, in your discussions about basic income and that's kind of what I've, we've asked karen to um to, to think about today so i'd now like to to get the reaction from from reverend karen webber as i said earlier karen is a methodist minister in birmingham uh in in two different parts of birmingham actually in in one of the, a more affluent area and also um one of these areas which is so-called left behind as alex outlined so she's also one of the, the co-directors of basic income uk um and she's an experienced basic income advocate in the region I, i've seen her run some brilliant sessions 
with her church members on basic income over the years and seen her speak to people all over Birmingham about the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd say she knows better than most what the average kind of Brummie thinks about this idea uh, and how people respond to it. Um, so Karen, what, what's your reaction uh, to, to what you've heard in the research from Alex and, and does this kind of play out uh, in, your, in your own experience? Oh, thanks, Mike. Um, firstly, thank, thank, thank you, Mike, for um, for inviting me to uh, to, to to participate in, in in this morning's webinar, and and thanks to Alex for uh, for that um, piece of research. That uh, yeah, I feel like a kid in a toy shop. What to reflect on first? Um, yeah, there, there was so much there, Alex, that really resonated with me. This whole precariousness, I find, it just plays out, you know, constantly within, you know, particularly one one area of, of, of one place of work for me, um, which is a, in an inner city area. Mm -hmm. And what struck a chord with me was this whole this this whole idea of a left behind community which certainly, you know, my community in South Yardley, it's, it's that feeling, that sense of feeling left behind to the point that where it, it's almost become a depressed community and it doesn't really know how to get itself out of that, you know, that sense of depression and, 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 and everything that surrounds that. Um, the, the other thing that, that, a few other things that struck a chord, um, I was particularly interested in, in your research, um, partly because, well, well, mainly actually because of the mm -hmm. areas that you're exploring, Northfield and West Brom and Dudley and Warsaw, um, I kind of have an interest in all of those areas because although I'm a minister over in South Yardley and Linden, I also live part, live as well in Warsaw, in Warsaw, which is also close to Dudley and West Bromwich. Okay. Um, what struck me when you spoke about this this idea of, of that, that the one comment about this idea of summit for nothing we don't get summit for nothing and that really struck a chord because i actually remember being in northfield uh, when i was training for ministry and we were sent out to northfield um on a on a for a for a day to do some project and we didn't know what to do so we just took a bowl of sweets to give away to just chat with people and nobody would take those sweets. And at the end, I said to one gentleman, why won't you take a sweet? And that was his words precisely were, you don't get anything for nothing. You know, so it's this idea that, you know, you can't get anything for nothing. You know, that's kind of ingrained into, into um, communities that have been left behind. Um, in South Yardley, we've just not long started up a food pantry. Um, and so this whole idea around food pantries and food banks, you know, really resonate with me. We see people come in struggling to make ends meet, um, struggling to, to, to negotiate themselves through the process of universal credit, um, constantly needing help, constantly needing support, constantly feeling depressed and left behind. And so that that really, really resonated with me. Um, and this comment of this, uh, uh, somebody said, I think a quote was, I'd love to see, I'd love to see not as many food banks, because um, that would mean people would be able to afford food. And what we've learned at the food pantry is that, I mean, there's, there's just massive amounts of food, surplus food. Nobody should go hungry in our country. There is food out there. And there is a massive amount of food that will go to waste if it is not eaten. And so really for me, you know, the, 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 for me, the a food pantry, I don't want to diss food banks. The food pantry is kind of a step towards a, uh, towards a little bit more equality because a food pantry, you pay for your food, you pay a small amount mm. for a decent amount of food. But the thing is, until we're all eating from, from places like that, there isn't really any equality. Um, and I think really this, 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 when I speak to people on the ground about this idea of a basic income, there's this sense of, well, it's a nice idea, but you know, you don't get anything for nothing. People are gonna waste this. People are gonna squander it. You know, it's like people don't quite know what to do with it. And people don't understand that they actually have the power to, to, 
to bring about change. And I think that's the, the kind of thing that's kind of missing in the basic income conversation, because a lot of the language that's used is kind of inex can, can, can be quite inaccessible to people on the ground. And if, it, if, you, if the language is inaccessible, then you don't feel part of that conversation. And if you're not part of that conversation, you can't put your heart into it. So then you can't bring about change. So I think there's just a piece of work to be done within the conversation, the whole conversation within basic income is to kind of bring it to a level where people can see, well, yet yeah, that, that, that includes me. So I can bring about change because until people on the ground call for change, well, petitions aren't really going to cut it, I don't think. It's people on the ground that have got to bring about effective change. So I think really that might have taken up my five minutes, I think, Mike. Um, yeah. Discuss. Discuss. Thanks you so much, Karen. Um, and uh, let's just, there we go. Um, yeah, lo lots of interesting stuff there. Um, and lots I'd li like to unpack now for the next uh, 30 minutes uh, that we've got left uh, in this um, webinar. And we've, we've already had a couple of questions come in. Um, and just, just, just a reminder, if, you, if you'd like to put any, any comments or questions in the, either the chat box or the Q&A function, that would be really wonderful. Uh, and, and I'll be able to, to get those, um, I, either answer some of them myself or get to, Alex and, and Karen with those. I just want to, uh, before coming to some of those questions, I, I guess I wanted to reflect on something that it really came, having sat through some of those, um, uh, those focus groups and hearing, you know, how this is played out on the ground as well, Karen, it was just like this reinforcing that it was this precariousness, the insecurity mm -hmm. that came through almost every single story that we heard. It was just like mm -hmm. quite a, a, um, quite overwhelming I think um obviously it was that they were taken at a time in in, in the winter where, where Covid was really ripping through and it really felt um was really um uh hitting people hard but I wonder Alex just a quick question on is there any evidence that 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 is being played out worse in so-called red wall seats or so-called left behind areas so you mentioned earlier on in your presentation about the wider UK labour market and how it's become more precarious in the gig economy those figures I think were if I remember rightly from the slides are UK based have you done because obviously it's not just work on this topic you've done work around wider issues around Brexit and the areas that voted for it are there is there any evidence that that precariousness and changes to the labour market are any more um, uh, felt in those kind of areas and therefore maybe making the kind of more fertile ground for something like a basic income. Is, is there any evidence yeah. of that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's actually, you, believe it or not, it's actually very difficult to get regional and local data on, on the level of insecure forms of work. I mean, you, you have to relate to more indirect proxies such as um, median earnings, which I think in um, uh, Dudley were about £450 a week. You know, if you compare that to um, Bromsgrove, which I think was about 580 So, So... If you use earnings as a proxy, you would say, yes, it's more insecure for, 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 for that reason and nothing else. And you can compare that to other demographic indicators for boroughs like um, educational attainment and uh, proportion of people with no formal qualifications. If you take Sandwell Borough, which covers West Brom, um, you know, one in five of the workforce have no formal qualifications. And, and you know, it, it's very easy to attest the unemployment rates for those with, with no qualifications or, or, you know, GCSE are higher than those with a degree. So if you use that as a proxy, you would say, yes, it's more insecure in these areas on average. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose what's suggested in your research is that is that that kind of level of precariousness mixed with which was which has been, as you outlined, has actually been a much longer story over the last 10 years or so. Um, but like really hit home by COVID. It's that kind of ingredients, I suppose, that maybe makes basic income suddenly more interesting to people than it otherwise would. Is, is that what you're basically suggesting is that th these are like the potentially more fertile ground now for just discussions about basic? Is that the kind of... Yeah, I, th yeah, I, think, it, I think it does because, I mean, uh, what, 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 what the 
pandemic has done is just throw a, a significant chunk of the workforce who thought they had secure job prospects and careers um, in, in, into the firing line in that sense, you know, it, it, to, to then realise that no, nobody, you know, shy of two years tenure in their job is secure. Um, if, if you're working in the services sector, that's especially so, you know, you think think of the giant sector in this country we refer to as social consumption, you know, your leisure centres, your cafes, you know, uh, restaurants, bars. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what it's done. I, I'm not going to say it's a game changer, but I think, you know, for a lot more people now realise that they can be, not, you know, thrown out at a moment's notice when, when the going gets tough and, and then then to have to go and apply for the dole, as it were, and then see what it's actually like to sign on, I think would disabuse any notions that, you know, you know, um, that life is somehow easy as a benefit recipient. So I want to I want to come to some of the comments now. Then, so um, I think it's Barb in 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 the chat. First of all, has, has said, you know, her comment was, you know, certainly the main thing that we see on the ground uh, is that people not believing that this is this is possible, um, and and that's partly because I think we've been blitzed by this over the last thirty years about how we need austerity, um, and this is like a you know whatever we spend as a government, you know, we, we've somehow got to recoup the kind of idea that. Of a household budget, which of course is is nonsense about how governments are actually run, but um, yeah, like did, 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 did this come across in your conversations that you have with Karen, and and likewise with Alex? I, I noticed in the focus groups, people <laughs> didn't speak in the first person when they're talking about basic. Income. Even when we asked them what would you do with a basic income, it often meant that they were talking about someone else, and it goes into what you were saying, Karen. It's like it, they don't quite believe that they would get it as well. That, and then it goes, I was really moved by the kind of sweets analogy. Is that something that you hear a lot, Karen, about the kind of, they don't quite believe it's something that they would get? Yeah, I mean, totally. Every day, Mike, it's, you know, you, you put this idea to people and it's, oh, that's, that's interesting. That, that, that sounds interesting. But no, um, it, it, it always goes on to no, because people are wasting it. And where's the money going to come from? Um, and we haven't got enough. We haven't got enough money. And um, what, what is interesting, though, is when when you kind of like you, you listen to that. And then what I often do is try and say, yeah, but I'm asking you what would if I gave you, you know, 200 pounds a week. Tell me what you would do with 200 pounds a month no questions asked and I've, I've done that in a lot of services and a lot of um, community groups giving people like a dummy check and um and said you know just write on it what you would actually do with this money if you got it and and everybody writes something that nobody puts anything selfish on those checks you know so that that's a bit of a game changer when you do something like that um but yeah there's this massive sense of we can't afford it you know uh, and we've got a very good government that, that have got this really good, a uh, good at campaigning, aren't they? With these like little slogans that kind of you know get Brexit done and that kind of stuff, that that kind of suck people in, and so they can't imagine anything else is possible. Yeah. Um, so I it's trying to find ways to change. Challenge, yeah, exactly. A challenge for basic income advocates or any other you know advocates of a different idea it needs to find those like smart yeah. ways of communicating, and it sounds as though trying to flip the question or, or put that question back on people about what would you do with it rather than yeah. what any like misconceptions you might have on, on what other people might spend it on because I, I think Alex when, when we press people actually every single time it was generally what would be considered a, you know a public good or that they would do with it is, is that right but then when the, when you asked about other people it was then you got into some questions about what, whether people would spend it on so-called public bads so is that did that did you recall those yeah i mean there, there, there was there, there was some of that you know like the, the comment about if somebody had a, a drug addiction problem they would just take the money and spend more of it on drugs um you know you you, you got these sort of things but i i, I think um I, I want to touch on that point you made about the government being like a household because i mean it's not you know i mean for, for anyone who thinks that the government has a problem paying debt you know, the government doesn't have a working life for 28 years. It doesn't retire, you know, and then go and claim the pension. I mean, the government in that sense is collective and immortal. So and in that sense, you know, the, 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 the cost of paying for the pandemic, for example, can be, be put away over decades and, let, and let, let the economy take care of itself. But um, the other point, I think, around who would pay for it is an interesting one. You know, the wealthy would pay for it. And then, then you, 
you get into asking people, well, do you think you're, you know, do you think you're well off? I mean, do you think you're wealthy? I mean, what do you earn? And you know, to the extent that someone was willing to divulge that. But if you consider that only 10% of the workforce in this country earn more than about 40,000 pounds in their job, that would tend to me to say the other 90% are not wealthy. And that when one talks about income tax rises, for example, to pay for a more generous uh, basic income for the, you know, amongst the poorest and so on, um, it's not you, the not wealthy, who are, who would pay for it. You know, it's about asking those who earn a lot of money to take more of their fair share. Yeah. And, and that's another point about the, you know, we live in a society. If I sneeze, you catch a cold. If I turn up to work and I sneeze because I don't get a decent sick pay, you catch a cold. The business you work for gets lost productivity. That there's, there's something to be said here about trying to explain that we live in a system, in an economy, and what we do affects everybody else. And, and the notion that I'm all right, Jack, bugger you, in the long run is self-defeating because it imposes a cost on the rest of us. Yeah. So I think this is like a really good point to bring in a point that uh, Chris Smith, who's joining us uh, from the Centre for the New Midlands, uh, a new think tank in the West Midlands uh, region, um, and, and he's made two points, but one, one I think kind of plays to this is, it, it says, would it not make the middle classes richer and therefore increase inequalities? I, I, like if, if it is a universal payment, let's say, you know, nine grand a year or whatever it is per month, um, the middle classes, would, would they just save it, as an example, and then the lower income families would, would tend to uh, you know, use it on the on the daily day to day to day costs like food and utilities, um, and therefore, you know, it is is by having it universal, um, uh, you know, make, making those inequalities worse. Now, I think that came up a little bit in the um, in the focus groups, in that some people did say that they wanted to save it, and um, but they, it felt as though they felt a bit guilty about that, like they how somehow. Oh, I don't need it. I would just save it. But then, when you probed them a little bit more, and actually the savings were, were pretty low. They were kind of, and, and statistics show that actually a lot of the country have very little savings. Do, do you want to unpack that a little bit, Alex? And, and also after that, hear your experiences of people and, and their savings, Karen, and, and actually how that actually plays out across the income spectrum. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting point, Chris, that you make there, but. Um... I, I think, Michael, you, you, you're right in that, you know, the level of indebtedness in this country is very high, even for the so-called middle classes. Yeah, I mean, who, who really are they? Um, uh, would it increase inequality? Well, I, I suppose it depends on how you, you fund it, you know, how you, what level do you set it at? You know, we, we espouse the notion of universality that everyone gets at the point of delivery. But then when you, when you talk to, you know, about coming to pay for it, um, you know, the model that uh, myself and colleagues espouse has a taper in it that effectively makes the, the better off, you know, pay more for it. And, and the other point about paying for a, a UBI is that, that we espouse a, 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 a fundamental reconfiguration of taxing from income to wealth. And so if the, if the middle classes are the, the asset owning classes, then, you know, you, you try and shift the conversation around who pays to looking at things like a, a land tax. Or, or, or really, you know, vamping up capital gains tax. And, and I think, you know, if, if there are questions there about would it increase inequality? Well, no, I mean, I, th I think you, you can combat the fact that the biggest source of, of growing inequality in this country in the last 20 to 30 years has been those who own property and those who don't. Because it affects everything else. If you have an asset, you know, you can go to the bank and borrow money at uh, far more favorable rates than someone who's, you know, trying to start up a business and has no collateral. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, you might say that it could, but I don't think so. I think depending on how you, you structure it and fund it and make it pay. No. Yeah, I, that's the key point, isn't it? I think if if, you, if it was just a flat payment, then then of course it might have problems with it. It's about where you where you get the money from and, and f following the money, to, you know, tends to be around wealth. But I, I think, but yeah, I, the, the story there was, the, I think it was a woman from Warsaw who had lost her job um, for the first time since 1984. I, if I remember rightly, it was what you would deem a more middle-class job and she was, yeah. in her words, effing terrified. And I think this this concept of actually, it's okay to have some savings um, because the the, re the kind of the, this sense of insecurity is so real. Um, but Karen, you, you, don't, you got anything to, what, what have you got on that point around savings? And, and particularly what people, when people, when you ask people, what would they do with it? 
know, what, what what's the kind of people's response around saving? Yeah, I mean, generally, when when uh, overwhelmingly, um, I mean, most of most of most of my church members, they're older folks and they're they're uh, receiving a pension. So in many ways, they don't feel like they they, they it, there's almost a sense of guilt when when you say like you know, so I'll give you this two hundred pound. Imagining I'm giving you this two hundred pound a month, what would you do with it? Oh, I don't know. You know, I would um, I'd spend a bit. I'd save a bit. Oh, I'd, get, I'd help my family. Um, but there's that sense of almost guilt. Um, but also there's that sense of fear around not having enough. You know that, it, and I think we're generally terrified of of not having enough do you know what I mean there's this scarcity and, and I think the more you have the more scared you become of not having anything and and what was interesting I remember around the Corbyn time you know I remember back in the day when Corbyn was a thing and um and and I remember it during his campaign and and he was advocating for increased in, increased taxes and I remember my daughter coming home and saying it's mad you know mom because you know only uh, you'll only pay extra taxes if you if you're earning over 80 grand a year um and then it's probably something like 50 pound um and at that time she was earning 16 grand a year and she went well i'll be happy to pay an extra 15 grand 15 15 grand 50 pound a year um and, and I, it, it, it says something doesn't it because actually in our society the the, the those who have less least do generally give more but those who have more feel like they have to hold on to it yeah um totally that's, that's one of the things that we'll need to cut through um mm. i want to it's, it's just ticking over 10 we've still got a couple of minutes, couple of minutes left before we finish up so a couple of um points in the in the q a and both made by first dick rogers um, and then kind of Jane Thomas, who's kind of built on this a little bit. And it's um, a concept, you know, it, it's, it's, well, I'll use the word, it, it's UBI, uh, a plot by the Fourth Industrial Revolution and the World Economic Forum to kind of capture the world's population and seize their property. Um, and if not, how do we know? And it, I don't think Dick was saying that he necessarily thinks that, but he's heard other people say this and Jane kind of backed this up. So say. You know, I've heard the same thing about the you know, fourth industrial revolution slash new world order. There's some research around this and there's, there's like some suggestions that this is, this is happening. Um, how, have you kind of come across this at all uh, in, in, in your conversations with people on the ground, Karen? I, I, I don't think it came up at all in, in the, in the focus groups. So I don't think that's cut through in that, in that starker way, but we have, I think it's a common argument. Sometimes you hear, around the left is like, is this somehow like a, a kind of a, quite a capitalist idea that's actually just going to save the system and doesn't really, and, and you, when, when people hear about the likes of Milton Friedman being interested in this or Mark Zuckerberg or, or Elon Musk, uh, that's, that's, that, or maybe, maybe we shouldn't be thinking about this. So, so what's your, mm. your responses to, to that first Karen and, and then Alex? Mm. Sorry, Mike. You're gonna to have to. Can you can you run? Me, <laughs> that was a lot of a lot of information there. Can you run me by that? Run that by yeah. Me? So 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 it, some some say that uh, and that this is like the idea of a UBI is somehow like mm. a a kind of plot by these like elite capitalists to kind of save capitalism um, and and you know run through all of this automation and take take away the profits themselves and and just give a little, little back in the form of a basic income. Um, and that, mm. that, that if we hear people like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk talking about it, then it's somehow maybe like something that we sh we as, as as people if people identify as progressives, then we should be inherently um, skeptical of that. What, what a do you come across? I, I, that's I'm not sure. Like I suppose the average ordinary person kind of I've not really heard that. I don't know if that's true mm. of you, mm. but like what 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 would your response be to that? And um, and kind of uh, and, and then likewise, Alex. Oh gosh, I don't know, Mike. Um, I think, uh, firstly, I, I, uh, nobody on the ground has ever mentioned anything like that to me before. I don't think there would be any understanding. I don't want to prejudge. I'm just saying I've not heard any of that language uh, on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's partly because 
you know, when I when you talk to people on the ground, me personally, this is what this is the, com the conversations I'm having. There's a deep mistrust of politics in general. So it's almost like, well, we don't know who to trust um, because they're all only out for, each, uh, for themselves anyway. So so it's almost like this sense of, so we, um, we're just kind of voting for the best of the bad, really. Um, uh, in terms of what I would think, I, I don't know, Mark, I'd have to give that some more thought. Well, um, whether it would be a capitalist ploy. Yeah. Have a think about it, Karen. Yeah, well, have a think about that. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Um, good, good, good questions. Alex, what, what's your thoughts on that, that topic? Well, I mean, there's, there's a bit of historical precedent for that, isn't there, in the sense that with the creation of the welfare state in the 1940s, um, you know, I mean, a, a, academics like, um, well, I suppose even Guy Standing himself made the point when he talked about economic security after the Second World War that a large part of the so-called capitalist class rec recognised it was in their own self-interest to ensure that uh, working people had enough money to spend to buy the capitalist products. Yeah, I was you know, Musk, you know, if he, if he thinks that automation is going to threaten a load of jobs, uh, some say it does, um, who's going to buy his cars? You know, that's the old joke. If the robots make everything, then who, who will consume the products the robots make? Hence, we, we, we see arguments around, you know, a, a shift in the notion of, of, of waged income to, to income in a more broader sense. Uh, is it a capitalist plot? No, I mean, well, one could well invert that comment and say, well, you can make the techie giants pay for it, you know? And, and we've certainly seen arguments around digital taxing to, to make sure the likes of Google and Facebook do pay more tax. Um, the, the notion of Industry 4.0, well, I mean, this, you know, as Dick alludes, is this, this idea of more digitalised production, you know, more use of robots, more use of computers in production. Yeah, they can destroy jobs, but they'll also create jobs so that the, the person who loses their job as a manual operative may well retrain to be a, a, a computer uh, programmer or designer, you know. Um, it, it, yeah. I don't, I don't see that. I don't see it as a capitalist plot, no. But I, I do think that more enlightened capitalists, if I could use that phrase, do recognise that we live in a society. We have to ensure that um, society functions so that production and consumption carry on. Yeah, I, I think my response, you know, whether we like it or not, we, we live in a society where where money and cash is important. Like we need it, and mm. uh, we, we can have really philosophical debates about you know and, and who has it, but um, the I, I think it somehow distracts from and there definitely should be a discussion about how we be wary of the growing powers of of um some of these new tech um industrialists but like the that that shouldn't be a distraction from what people really need which is cash right now and i think it's, yeah um uh you know i don't it's really interesting that it's asked of ubi but it's not asked of say child benefit child mm. benefit isn't a capitalist plot just because it's mm. cash um nor, nor is the pension you know it, i think in, in near in those terms um you know it's that those are clearly measures to reduce poverty reduce inequality um and uh and those are really pressing urgent questions particularly now and i think if we're sitting around waiting you know whether or not it might be bad um for just just because somebody else that we don't agree with likes it doesn't mean it's a bad idea and it's quite a, uh, unfortunately a, quite a childish way our politics is as, as kind of this good left right good bad thing um so i think i think there's a there's, a, there's an interesting discussion there but i think it mustn't distract from you know more pressing issues um the i just want to bring in uh, a point by emma emma bridger from uh, also from uh, birmingham, city, birmingham, uh, birmingham university so Bermondsey. um so emma's saying i think it's really important that that, that you know the question around savings um and hoarding of wealth by the middle classes that like are important to consider and maybe do some more research around um because because we are told that you know there's a there's a story that more universal welfare programs so like like a, like a basic income are more efficient um than the more targeted uh, like the one that we have now with the universal credit um um but but there is a there is a problem though isn't there if if it was there i don't know it, about um, if, if middle classes are just putting it in their or that like in their savings account and that, and then others are just it's just going out of their account Alex do you want to come you can see I don't I don't I mean I, I mean Emma makes a valid point in that sense but it, do I see it as a problem no I mean and, and I'll reinvent I'll, I'll say it this way you know if you are saving ostensibly for your retirement or some such I haven't got a problem with that you know I mean think of the nature of pension coverage in this country 
you know, we referred to the state pension earlier, but I mean, that that's nine grand a year. I mean, um, if you're one of the many who don't have, ac have access to a company pension scheme or some generous private pension scheme, um, that may help you benefit in the longer term. You know, if you put it away and save it, so what? You know, I, I, I don't think that undermines the principle of universality and I don't think it undermines the principle of being able to pay for it. And Karen, is that like played out? You, you mentioned you, you have your, you've ministered in de de various places uh, and currently, you know, in two very different places. Like when you've had conversations with about basic income with with people from those each of those areas, ha has there been any like difference in like when you ask them what would you spend it on? Does is there tend to be a different answer? Um, <clears throat> yeah, and. Um... I mean, I've, the church, the church I've got in the more affluent area is the only a church I've been with for six months. So the conversation there is quite new. So they're still learning the concepts of, of, of basic income. But there is a very big sense there of, oh, well, we, we, we really don't need this. But of course, the poor. Sorry, I'm apologise now that you have to listen to that voice um, every morning. And we would, um, you know, we would advocate for that. And, and so there's that sense of, you know, it, it's happening to somebody else over there. You know, without realising actually, like 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 Alex has said, you know, what impacts on one impacts on us all. So, um, and and that whole idea, I, I, I mean, what Alex has just said about you know those in in, in middle income, um, putting away money for 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 pensions. I mean, what, what, why shouldn't you know why shouldn't that happen? Um, but then there are people at the very top end of the scale who are just earning m massive amounts of money every day just through interest, um, through doing nothing. That's money for nothing, isn't it? In a sense. Um, and it's that. So what's that saying? People who earn a thousand pound a an hour have convinced people who earn fifteen pound an hour that people who earn eight pound an hour are the problem. Yeah, and it's that you know, it's that's that, this whole blind thing, and um, instead of thinking, well, it's about us all flourishing, and so how does that all happen? If money's a mm -hmm. construct, we've constructed money, haven't we? So we can surely we can find a better way of making sure everyone's has enough. Great point, Karen. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna end it there. Um, uh, we're co coming up to the end of our time. Uh, thanks again for people tuning in this morning and, and to watching this back on on video. Um, quickly, Alex, the, pl the plan is to seek further funding around and to do further research around this issue, isn't it? It's just such a vital topic and, and relatively little research has been done around. Like there's lots done around the economic modelling, but not much done around the public perceptions of basic income. Do you just briefly talk a just your ambition about where this research is going to go and, and when people can read the report, which I think next week, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right, Michael. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll release our uh, preliminary report next week. So we'll... we'll, we'll put that up in the public domain so you can all access that by this time next week and we're hoping uh, early next week so that we can get a, a pitch out there in advance of the um, local elections on Thursday where we're going to take the research where we hope to do some more focus group work um, overture to you there Karen and we would also like to do some larger scale survey work so we may seek funding for that I think um, Emma expressed an interest along those lines so they're the plans and, and hopefully we'll have a, an unfolding uh, story to tell here over the next couple of months. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. Uh, really looking forward to reading that. So this is obviously like a, re a piece of research, which is really welcome to see. Um, and us at the Basic Income Conversation uh, have recently launched uh, a research network um, that is solely for researchers um, to meet each other and stay up to date with the latest research that's happening around basic income. Uh, both Alex and, and David uh, from, also from the Centre for Brexit Studies are a part of it. And you can sign up on our website, uh, which I'm just putting a link in the chat and there'll be a link in the video as well. Um, and, and as part of that research network, we'll be running regular public seminars, uh, the first of which is on Thursday, the 20th of May, where we have a great panel of speakers reflecting on what's happening in the United States with basic income and what it means for us here in the UK. So some of you will be aware that the Biden presidency has just introduced what is in effect a basic income for children as well as a third stimulus check that um, some comment commentators are now saying is starting to see steps towards a basic income. And um, so we have two academics from the, uh, the States um, speaking virtually to us uh, and also a Financial Times journalist joining us for that one. So again, I'll put the link in the chat to that. 
um, but likewise there'll be a link in the in the video um, and do keep your eye out next week for what's happening in the elections um, you can check out the UBI lab networks uh, page to see which mayoral candidates in the West Midlands but also right across the country who which candidates have pledged their support for basic income um, uh, which will be really interesting to see what happens next Thursday and, and afterwards uh, and very finally well look, the last two things if you want to start your own basic income conversation and um, this could be with your friends and family in your workplace with your community we've created a toolkit to help you do exactly that and I know Karen's used it and others have as well we've designed it um, all for you to make it super easy and you can download it from our website again put in the link in the chat there but um but others uh, will be able to access that on the, on the link to the video. And there are more Centre for Brexit Studies webinars. They happen every month. Um, so I don't think they've announced the next month's one yet, but do stay tuned for more information on their website and on social media, um, and uh, which I think is at BCU underscore Brexit. Um, and but that's enough from me. Big thanks to everyone that's joined us this morning. Um, and uh, uh, and particular thanks to Karen and Alex for, for sharing their insights this morning. So really interesting stuff. And as you say, Alex, the start of the conversation, I think, about, about this topic. So yeah, and, and have wonderful days. Thanks, Mark. And thanks for the expert sharing. That was really great. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Speak soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye.